Well, after never reaching a unanimous agreement on who should be their Speaker of the House, House Republicans are now unanimous about two things. First, House Republicans unanimously voted for a bill to defund the police. That's right. The very first thing House Republicans voted on was defunding the police. The police they want to defund are the federal tax police. House Republicans have voted unanimously to defund the Internal Revenue Service in a way that would specifically target the capacity of the Internal Revenue Service to investigate the tax returns of the very richest people in America. Republicans voted unanimously to make it easier for America's richest people to get away with tax crimes. And Republicans have now voted unanimously to create what our first guest tonight calls the Republican Committee to Obstruct Justice. Republicans are calling the committee, which is structured as a subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee, the, quote, select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government. And that is a perfect example of what former Harvard professor and senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan called semantic infiltration. The concept of semantic infiltration is to infiltrate your opposition with your language that forces them to tell the lie that your language tells. A perfect example is Fox News. Every time someone says the words Fox News, they are lying about what Fox News does. That is a deliberate lie created by Rupert Murdoch when he created the Fox Republican propaganda channel and infiltrated the opposition to Republican propaganda by forcing the opposition to call his propaganda channel Fox News. The propaganda channel created by Rupert Murdoch is not now and never has been in the news business, which is why I don't use the name that Rupert Murdoch gave to his propaganda channel. Every time you use the name that Rupert Murdoch gave his propaganda channel, you have successfully allowed Rupert Murdoch to infiltrate your own vocabulary, your own semantics. That is what Daniel Patrick Moynihan meant by semantic infiltration. Republicans are masters of semantic infiltration. They came up with the phrase pro-life to mean anti-abortion. Everyone is pro-life, but Republicans seized possession of that phrase so that the news media would call only Republicans pro-life, which most of the news media does, because the news media is highly susceptible to semantic infiltration. The news media is the target of semantic infiltration. Most of the news media will make no effort at all to try to overcome the semantic infiltration that the Republicans are using in the name of their new subcommittee, which, as I said, they are calling the Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. It is a subcommittee to investigate federal investigators. So today's the day that Republicans made congressional history by creating a new investigative committee to launch investigations where Congress has never launched investigations before, including ongoing criminal investigations by the Justice Department. That's right, for the first time in the history of the House, a committee has been created to investigate ongoing criminal investigations by the Justice Department, including criminal investigations by the Justice Department of Republican members of Congress, some of whom want to be members of the new subcommittee to investigate the investigators who are investigating them. Here is who the Republicans will not be investigating. So have you made any decision as to how you're going to handle George Santos in his time? No, but I'll tell you when we do. So no investigation 
of a pathological liar who lied about every single aspect of his personal history and lied about his income and delivered a mysterious $700,000 contribution to his campaign. No investigation of any of that. No investigation of George Santos. Given all that we know now about what Congressman Santos lied about his resume, the various inquiries into him at the federal and local level, do you think that he should be a member of Congress? Well, you saw him seated last week. There were no challenges to that. This is something that's being handled internally. Obviously, there were concerns about uh, what we had heard. And so we're going to have to sit down and talk to him about it. And that's something that we're going to deal with, uh, just like there's a lot of other things we're going to deal with. So we're going to have to sit down and talk to him about it. George Santos is under criminal investigation by the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. George Santos is under criminal investigation by the Attorney General of the State of New York. George Santos is under criminal investigation by the Republican District Attorney on Long Island. But George Santos is not going to be under investigation at any time by the Republican House of Representatives. We're going to have to sit down and talk to him about it. That is a lie. Steve Scalise is never going to sit down and talk to George Stant Santos about all of George Santos's lies and possible criminal conduct, including criminal financial conduct. But Steve Scalise and Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan are all eager to have their special subcommittee go to work investigating any federal government investigators who are currently investigating Republicans like Donald Trump and Jim Jordan and Pennsylvania Congressman Scott Perry, who, according to Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony to the January 6th committee, asked for a pardon from Donald Trump for his possible criminal conduct in trying to overturn the 2020 presidential election. The January 6th committee has evidence that some Republican members of the House of Representatives asked Donald Trump for pardons for their possible criminal conduct in trying to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Today, after a Republican on the floor of the House asked the Democrats to, as he put it, populate this committee with serious Democrats. That is to say, send serious Democrats to this new subcommittee to investigate the investigators. After that request, for serious Democrats to be appointed to that committee, Jim McGovern, the top Democrat on the House Rules Committee, said this. I would just say in response to the gentleman who said that he hopes that we populate this select committee with serious Democrats, that, uh, that he populates uh, the committee with Republicans who did not ask for a pardon, who did not have their phones seized by the FBI. The Republicans will have nine members of the committee. The Democrats will have six members of the committee. The only guarantee we have about members of the committee not having asked for pardons is that none of the Democratic members of the committee will have ever asked for a pardon from anyone. Today, in his first speech on the floor of the House, our first guest tonight said this. The primary purpose of this special subcommittee is to interfere with the special counsel's ongoing investigation into a conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election. This is a shocking abuse of power. But it's not just the usual efforts by members on the other side of the aisle to once again do Donald Trump's dirty work. This time, they're trying to protect themselves. One of them, a member from Pennsylvania, had his cell phone seized pursuant to a court order finding probable cause that he committed a crime. Yet he has indicated that he wants to be on this subcommittee so that he can undermine a criminal investigation into himself. My Republican counterparts can dress up the subcommittee with a menacing name, but let's call it what it really is, the Republican Committee to Obstruct Justice. Before Daniel Goldman went to the floor of the House to deliver that speech, he went to the office of George Santos this morning to hand deliver a copy of a six page complaint against George Santos that Congressman Dan Goldman and Congressman Richie Torres delivered to the House Ethics Committee 
this morning. We haven't seen a single um, movement on the part of Republican leadership. They have not commented on this publicly. They have not condemned George Santos and all of his lies. Uh, they have adopted him as one of their own. The best outcome is accountability. I mean, we have to send a message that if you defraud the voters, you're going to be held accountable. Congressman Porter, the first question has to be what America's been wondering since Friday night. Were you really reading that book or just pretending to read that book for the photograph? I was absolutely reading that book. It was actually my fourth book of the week. Um, I had read a book basically every day during those interminable um, alphabetical votes in which the Republicans struggled to, f to find leadership. Um, and so that book I picked up at a little free library on my walk um, from my uh, basement studio here in Washington to the Capitol building. OK, we so you really were reading it. Uh, so Senator Dianne Feinstein, that's the seat you'd be uh, running for. She is 89 years old. Uh, she would be 91 years old uh, during the uh, reelection campaign. If she joins the reelection campaign, uh, 92 years old when elected, that would take her term up to 98, six year term. Uh, she issued a statement today in reaction to your announcement saying everyone is, of course, welcome to throw their hat in the ring. And I will make an announcement concerning my plans for 2024 at the appropriate time. Right now, I'm focused on ensuring California has all the resources it needs to cope with the devastating storms slamming the state and leaving more than a dozen dead. Uh, what is your reaction to that statement by Senator Feinstein? Well, I would echo what Senator Feinstein said. I think she's exactly right. This should be a race in which there are different people stepping up and Californians get to decide who represents them in the U.S. Senate. Dianne Feinstein is a trailblazer, and the path that she has created for women in politics is one that I was able to follow um, right to the House of Representatives, and she has accomplished a lot, and I look forward to following in her footsteps to represent California in the U.S. Senate. Um, I also want to echo what Senator Feinstein said about the terrible storms that are ravaging California right now. But those storms really illustrate what's at stake. We cannot continue to have a Washington that ignores the threats of climate change, that is willing to cozy up to special interests like big oil rather than stand up to them. So I, my kids are in California. I hope they're staying safe and dry. Um, and my thoughts are with the first responders and all of the people um, who are um, suffering and having to, to bunker down and be safe. But this is what's at stake in this race. Are we going to have a Senate that stands up to problems like climate change, that understands that our future is under attack? You are already being criticized by some Democrats in Calif California, Democrats who could be rivals to you uh, in this campaign for announcing in the middle of this storm and uh, that saying that that's an inappropriate time when California is being battered this way to announce a campaign like this. Well, as I just said, those storms, which are going to keep coming in the next few days, in the next few months, in the next years, are a result of us ignoring problems for too long in Washington, decade after decade, of not being willing to fight for our environment, of not being willing to understand that climate change is real. So I think it's important that we understand the storms illustrate that we do not live in typical times. In my three terms in the House, I was sworn in the first time in the longest shutdown in government history, the second time during an insurrection, and the third time, 15 votes to try to find a leader of the House. Washington's broken, and we're seeing the effects in California right now of that broken system. So while I, my heart goes out to everyone in California, and I am watching and supporting our local officials, our transit workers, our first responders, everybody who's helping um, right now, we need to send people to Washington who are going to solve problems like this. That's the best thing we can do to ensure California and the country are safe going forward. You know, in a, it's very common uh, for sitting senators who are choosing not to run in the next uh, election cycle to announce immediately after uh, the election that we just had. I know uh, the senator I worked for, New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, he announced that he would not run for election on November 7th of 1998, meaning he wouldn't run in 2000. He announced it of the full two years ahead of time, immediately after the previous election. Uh, and so that uh, any people, any candidates thinking of running for it could use the full time they need in an extremely expensive state like that uh, to mount a campaign. The campaign was eventually mounted by Hillary Clinton, who, who won that seat. What do you say to voters, though, who don't think about 
you know, the challenges of running in the biggest state in the union with the most television markets of any state in the union, the most expensive place to run anywhere in America. What do you say to voters who are exhausted by the politics of the last election that here you are, uh, as far as in their sense of it, immediately announcing the campaign for another election? I think Californians and Americans understand that Washington isn't delivering for them. And they see that the election after election, that doesn't change. Corporations continue to get their way in Washington while families get left behind. And what they want to see is leaders step up and run to represent them, to put their interests first, not to cave to special interests. And so I will tell you, in talking to voters across Orange County in my own very competitive races, they want more from Washington, not less. They want more people to listen to them, to engage with them, to visit their communities, to hear their problems. So announcing early gives me the time to do the work of understanding California and being ready to fight for it when I'm sworn into the Senate. Uh, quickly before we go, let me ask you a current House business question that I just asked Congressman Goldman. Uh, would you be willing and volunteer to serve uh, as one of the Democrats on this new select investigative committee uh, that the Republicans are creating? Well, I'm always willing to step up and serve when asked, um, but I will tell you I'm very, very excited about the work that we're going to have to do on the Oversight Committee. Um, that will be a, a full-time assignment, I think, as well. Um, I'm going to continue my work on the House Natural Resources Committee, but of course, I am always willing to step up and help my colleagues, help Democrats, help Americans get the government that they deserve. Congresswoman Katie Porter, hoping to become Senator Katie Porter, thank you very much for joining us tonight.